Well, let's just jump into this because uh, we've got a lot of stuff to get through um, uh, today as well, as well as our elections. Um, and then at the end, we'll do member updates. Um, and it sounds like we've got over 50 people going to be joining us today. So we may run out of time to uh, for everybody to talk, uh, to give your uh, give your update in person. But um, please, if if for whatever reason you don't feel like doing it, um, speaking to everybody, um, please um, email it in, and and the updates will be sent out by email okay um with all of that uh being said let's let's move on to the review of our, uh, our financial statement um and i believe sasha is going to do that for us please perfect good morning everybody um straight to business here for and we're going to be looking at the financial statement uh, with the year end of March 31st, 2023. And you can see for comparison the, the numbers from 2022. And so we're going to start off with our assets. And you can see the numbers along the right hand of your right hand side of your screen. And so for cash, we had $201,000. One sorry, two hundred one one hundred ninety one thousand um, dollars. We are holding some funds in trust for the Prairie Conservation and Endangered Species Conference, um, and that amount is one hundred thirty one thousand five hundred eighty one. And then GST receivables are at ten thousand four hundred eighty four dollars. So our total for uh, current assets is 343,256. And I'll encourage you guys again, like Neil had said, if you have questions throughout this update, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat. Um, as well, if you want to shoot an email um, for maybe a paper copy of this, if it's easier to follow, please do that as well. Um, you can send it to Catherine or myself. Uh, liabilities and net assets. So we uh, had funds due to Multisar, and that was 8,841. Um, you'll see the, the funds held in trust again for the Prairie Conservation and Endangered Species Conference at $131,581. And then our deferred revenue of 100,233. So a total there of $240,655. We'll get into the liabilities and net assets. And I just got to move the panel. Here we go. And so for unrestricted, we had $2,600, $2,601. Our contingency reserve is now at 100,000. And so we have a total there of 102, thousand six hundred and one for a grand total of three forty three two hundred and fifty six thousand or two hundred and fifty six dollars we get into the meat of it um so a thank you to um, our continued support of environment and climate change canada uh, we, we received uh, 50,794 uh, dollars were used in 2022 2020 23, Alberta Environment and Parks at 10,000. Uh, there was a bit of casino monies used, 6,346. Um, Multisar administration revenues at 7,962. There was a few donations at $150. Um, of course, we receive a little bit of interest income at $89. So for a total of 75,341. Our expenses are our special projects, which we'll see in detail in the following slide. Um, 58,294 uh, coordinator contracts and expenses at 56,441. Meeting expenses at $5,791. 
professional fees at 3300 insurance at 1452 office expenses at 1404 and website fees at $311 for a total of $126,993 Here's more detail about the special product projects. And so we received funding through Environment and Climate Change Canada for some multi-SAR uh, work. And uh, the money spent was 28,978. Uh, connecting corridors work was at 1,600. Um, some sponsorship monies that went out was $1,000 to uh, the Alberta Riparian Habitat Management Society. State of the Prairie work was at $808. Transboundary was a whole $21. Um, the Prairie Conservation and Endangered Species Conference, $15,000 went towards that. The range stewardship was $8,506. And isolated native habitats at $2,381. So for a total of $58,294. And so we just wanna really stress that the PCF is very grateful for all of you that are in attendance. We appreciate all of the work that our members do for us by sitting on the committees, by sharing information, by collaborating. Our board is a volunteer board. We, they direct the operations um, through guidance of the Prairie Conservation Action Plan and help guide our committees. We appreciate all of our partner work and funding. Um, we can't do anything out without all of our volunteers. Um, the donations are great. And uh, just, we're very, very grateful. This is a voluntary uh, collaborative that um, wouldn't exist without all of you. So thank you very much. Donations here, uh, Alberta Environment and Parks, Ian and Mavis Dyson, the Boundary Creek Landowners Association, and Environment and Climate Change Canada. And so now we're gonna move into the committee updates and I'm gonna pass it back to Neil. Um, Livio, if you're hearing me and because I wasn't able to get an email off to you, I need you to sign back in as a panelist. There is a link um, that was sent this morning to come in as a panelist and then you'll be able to share your screen. Um, Neil, if we can skip over and maybe shift Neil or Livio's to the final update, uh, yep. that will give him some time. Yeah, not a, not a problem. I can, uh, I can go through these other ones. Thank um, you. I, I got the job. You guys get to listen to me talk again. Um, it was decided that it just for time, time-wise, would be easier if I uh, I read the reports off. Uh, once again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat, and we'll have uh, somebody come on and and answer them if I can't. Okay. Um, so isolated native habitats. Um, the committee has had a contractor, Lori Hamilton, working on the uh, isolated habitats project with us. Um, to date, she has built a framework that covers all components of production mapping and has analyzed isolated habitats for five species at risk so far. Um, these species are the ferruginous hawk, the northern leopard frog, long-billed curlew, swift fox, and western harvest mouse. The isolated habitats for these species have all been added to the PCF connectivity portal. As part of the framework, each species also has its own report with a uh, synopsis of the species, its rarity, habitats, threats, and isolated, isolating conditions laid out in an easy to read information sheet. Um, once, once everything is finalized, these will be added to the PCF website under isolated habitats. Um, moving forward, the PCF will be working with Lori to run two plant species at risk through the framework as well as one more um, and we're also going to do one more mammal. Uh, Lori will also be drafting up a communication and engagement plan on how to move forward with this project. Uh, so that's that's kind of the update on the isolated native habitats. 
Um, and, and a lot of the funding for all of this work has been been coming through from the uh, Environment Canada and Climate Change, or yeah, ECCC. -E -C -C. I can't ever get the name right. Sorry. Um, the Range Stewardship uh, Committee uh, is planning on holding another range stewardship course um, this summer. The course is aimed at producers and are hands-on out in the field discussing range management, best practices, um, riparian health, plant identification. Uh, the committee will be meeting at the beginning of February to start planning for the 2024 course. So a couple of weeks from now, um, and we'll they'll get get going on that. I'm not sure where where they're figuring on going this year, but that will all be put out as well in emails. Um, okay, uh, no no questions so far. Connecting corridors, the data portal mapping tool is available to use on the PCF website. Um, the tool was constructed to help to guide users, including land use planners in recognizing high value connectivity areas that should be avoided or where appropriate mitigative measures can be used in development. Um, the committee will be looking at next steps for the mapping tool, including promotion and messaging. That's our, uh, the plan for them for the next year. Um, okay, Transboundary Grasslands Partnership. Um, they continue to hold their quarterly core team meetings, um, and they just had a very successful workshop in Swift Current on December 6th and 7th. Um, and the plan is the next workshop is going to be held in Montana. Um, there's a lot of information held at exchanged at these um, workshops. So if if you're able to attend one, I, I recommend it. Okay, so now uh, the Deep Roots Committee got going again. Um, it it kind of got swamped through uh, through COVID and with some retirements that occurred. Um, so what we've done, we've hired a contractor to deliver the Deep Roots program uh, to school age children for those who don't, don't remember what it was about. Um, Ellie Annett has so far delivered the program to five classes, so 124 um, students so far in 2023. Uh, Deep Roots was developed as an interactive video conference for kids in grades four to seven back in 2011. Um, it's been delivered to thousands of kids since then. Um, and we have developed pre and post activities to go along with the presentation. And then after the, the presentation has happened, there, there's an opportunity for the classes to enter a job be put into a draw for a field trip bursary of about 500 bucks um, to be put towards a field trip uh, out to a prairie um, location so that they can get some interpretive hands-on learning as well. Um, okay, the, the last one that I have on my list is the 2026 to 2030 Prairie Conservation Action Plan Committee. Um, the PCF will be putting together a working committee for the next PCAP this coming year. Uh, and if you're interested in helping develop this next PCAP, uh, please get in touch with Catherine. Um, it's it's fairly important that we have these these frameworks built each year and help us uh, focus our attention on on where we want to go as as our partnerships and as an organization itself. So. Um, that's what I have on my updates. Um, is is Livio ready to go? Thanks, Neil. Yeah, I've just um, sent him a screen share request. And so, Livio, when you're ready, you can unmute yourself and um, share your camera and your screen. Thank you.
Yeah, there you are. Good. Okay. All right. Morning. All right. Morning. Yeah. Morning. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. All right. Um, okay. Okay, can everybody see what I have on screen? Yes, Livio. Yes, all right. You got okay. it. Okay, great, thanks a lot. Okay, welcome everybody then. And uh, I just wanna give you an update on the state of the prairie. And this is a, a subcomponent of the committee of the state of the, uh, state of the prairie, supplemental data technical report. So if you remember some time ago, maybe about four years ago, the PCF uh, completed a technical report looking at change between 1990 and 2010. And one of the recommendations in that report was that we would look at information provided by whoever was producing inventory information over uh, the grassland and parkland areas, and we would report on it. So this is exactly what this is. is um, it's a follow through with one of the re those recommendations on the technical report, and it's called the Supplemental Data Technical Report. What it does, it looks at a series of slices of time from 1990 to 2020. So we're looking at 10 year intervals and change over those 10 year intervals. So as opposed to our previous report that just looked at just two two points in time, 1990 and 2010, this, will look, this, this report will look at four points in time. And it's, it's important, of course, just to see where we're at after 10 years since the last report, but it also provides us, uh, it starts providing us um, with points to look at trends of what's happened on the Canadian prairies, uh, like the Alberta prairies, I should say, over, uh, over 30 years, which is, I, I think would be quite insightful anyway. So here, here we go. Now, let me just, just hold on a second here. Let's see if I can move this, here we go. Okay, so current status. Is everybody able to see this? Yes? Yes? Yes, yes Livio. Okay, sure. <laughs> okay, so our current status on producing this report and doing the analysis is as I mentioned, four time periods, 1990, 2000, 2010, and 2020. What we're looking at is as we looked at in the previous report, the percent of native landscapes are quantified. In this report, not only percentages are in there, but actual hectares. So those are of graminoid coverage, wetland, treed, and water. So these four categories were, um, were selected because of uh, the structure of our previous analysis, uh, the report that we did a few years ago, and to some extent the limitations that we have in the data that we are using. And if you noted in the previous slide, the data that we're using is the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada data that pr they produce every five to ten years. So the data is stratified by uh, biome so we look at the biome in general the biome being the grassland plus the parkland by natural region specifically the grassland natural region and the parkland natural region the natural subregions and the land tenure so, so this whole strata here biome natural region natural region subregion and tenure tenure is completed so the report has already all that information in there but we're still waiting for the completion of the eco-district analysis and the administrative areas analysis. So this is, what it is, is really taking that data set and subdividing it by these uh, biophysical type distinctions, ecological type distinctions and the administrative areas. By the way, the, uh, the blue areas here, the blue, um, the blue denoted uh, categories, are the ones that I'm going to present here in the subsequent slide. So we'll look at the whole biome, we'll look at the natural regions, and we'll look at land tenure for both the grassland and parkland areas. Another aspect of this report is an accuracy analysis. 
because this data comes from the federal government, uh, it wasn't produced here in province, uh, we do a comparison of this information that we receive from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada with our GVI and the GVI for 2006 and 2010. Uh, our GVI is considered one of the best data sources because of the way it was compiled, the way it was, it was quality controlled. So whenever we use these alternative data sets that do have quality um, parameters associated with them, but we do check them with our GVI to see uh, how close they match with what we have had in GVI in previous years. So let's look at this first uh, slide here. So this is the grassland biome. So this is the parkland and grassland natural regions combined. So you can see here basically that from in 1990, uh, the area that was under native cover was 39.2%. And as we moved through the years, 2000, 2010, and 2020, we're at 37.6%. So there's been a slight decrease of about one and a half percent. You can see the amount in hectares at the top of these graphs. And in between the bar graphs, the green information here, is the amount of native cover that was lost in the intervals. So from 1990 to 2000, 140,000 more or less hectares were lost and subsequent 2000, 2010, and 2010 to 2020. When we sum up these amounts that of native cover loss, and we look at this note here, the total loss in 30 years is about 254,000 hectares. And that's equivalent, just to give you an idea how much that is, is somewhat less than CFB subfields. It's a, CFB subfield is 270,000 hectares. So it just gives you an, an idea of how much uh, native cover was, uh, was lost in those 30 years. Uh, the other thing about this is that, um, about this graph, and if you look at the, the trend line for percentages, is that yes, it's been decreasing. You can get an idea of how fast the decrease has been, not only quantitatively, but also graphically. Let's move on to the next slide. So now here we look at the grassland natural region specifically. As I mentioned, the previous one looked at the biome. This one is looking at the natural region, the grassland natural region. Same sort of graph. You can see the percentage of native cover in the grassland natural region decreasing here from 46.9 to 45.7. Here are the number of hectares on the top of each bar, bar and the total loss for though that period, that, that 30 year period, is at about 113,000 hectares. That's, oh, sorry about that. Uh, that's equivalent to the combined area of Calgary, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, and Red Deer. So over a 30 year period, that much native cover was lost in the nat grassland natural region. Let's move on to the next one. Now this graph is a little bit difficult to interpret, but I'll try to bring you through it. Again, we're looking at the grassland natural region. And we're looking at the distinction between where the native grassland is or the native, native cover is uh, on private and public. So the bar graphs here show uh, the public coverage and the private, private coverage, and you see the totals on top. But you know, you will, will, you'll be able to see all of these graphs and, and these graphs described in the report that's coming up and I'll let you know when it's gonna be available. But what I wanna point out in this graph is the loss in native cover between the private and the public coverage. So for example, if you see in the period in 1990, 2000, okay, so that's the first period that we were looking at, the loss in native cover for public lands was 22,688. Loss in native cover for private lands was 44,182. So those are the numbers that are sort of key to this graph here. And you can see how they change in the 2000-2010 period, 11,000, 14,000, 11,000 public, 14,000 public. And again, in 2010 
in 2020, and you can see that the loss in native uh, or native landscapes from 2000 to 73 uh, for the public, and then 26,700 for the private. So it gives you an idea. Again, the tendency of these losses is is downwards uh, for both private and public. But they also give you this graph also gives you sort of the amount of native cover in the private, which is the blue. Uh, sorry, yes, in the private, which is the blue bars, and in the public, which is sort of brownish red bars for each of the intervals. We continue on here. So let's look at parkland natural region. In the parkland natural region, you can see the total amount uh, in on the top of each of the bar, the total amount of native cover. You can see the percentage lost in each of the years, 1990, 2000, 2010, 2020, the loss being uh, about one and a half to two percent, something like that. So there it is. So the loss here, 30 year loss over that period from 1990 to 2010 is 132,000 hectares lost. And that's about equivalent to the area of the Kainai First Nation Reserve. So let's move on again. Again, the similar type of graph as we saw for the grassland, where we're looking at public and private um, distinctions of native cover. And you can see again, the trending downwards of native cover, in this case, the private from 61,000 to 32,000 to 16,000. So the trending downward is indicating the amount of loss of native cover over 10 to 10 years. So this is, I, I would say it's a good news uh, trend, a good news graph, whereas because in the 19, in the decade of the 1990, 2000, about 61,000 hectares were lost, whereas in the most recent decade, 2010, 2020, only, well, only 16,119 hectares were lost. So there's a trend downwards, which is a positive trend from our perspective. And you can see the similar trend here with the private, uh, sorry, the public lands. The public lands had in the 1990 interval, 12,769 hectares lost. And we move into the current period where 1,935 hectares of native cover was lost. So that's sort of how to interpret this graph. This, I would say it's it's a good trend that it's going downwards. And in fact, in, in the public lands, it's gotten quite low. Let's move on to the next one. So this is our last slide of this short presentation, and it's the next steps in completing the technical report, the update, the supplemental data. So in March 24, we're intending on, or we're hoping for the completion of the eco-district and administrative areas. So this is the same data that I've shown you now on these graphs for the various natural regions and, and biome, but they're uh, subdivided in terms of eco-district administrative areas. So that analysis and accuracy evaluation is also going to be done. The accuracy evaluation, as I mentioned before, where it's compared with GVI. Uh, in May 2024, oops, May 2024, uh, we hope to have the completion of the expert review of the technical report. So the technical report to be completed in March, a couple of months for expert review, and then by June, July 2024, we hope to release the State of the Prairie Technical Report, supplemental data. So that's uh, a brief update of where we are with the State of the Prairie Supplemental Data Analysis. Some data that we've already analyzed and is already in the report and is waiting for these other areas to be completed, and it gives you sort of an update of where we're going and how to over the 30-year period, which is fairly significant. We haven't had, we have never seen our our, our region, our, our the grassland natural region and, and parkland natural region in 30-year quantities to see trends of how the natural landscape is changing. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Livio. Oh. Um, so I, I, I think I've asked this before. Um, just just before, um, if you if you have questions for Livio on this, um, please type them into the chat, and I'll I'll read them out to him. Um, are we looking at why what's happened on the prairie or in the parkland that um, the 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 graph is is slowing down or the the loss is slowing down do you know have, has anybody looked at that yeah neil uh no i i presume a lot of the conservation efforts that have been going on over the 30 years are responsible for the decrease in loss I think uh, one of the things that we looked at was uh, the amount of loss, regardless of the decade, but why was there significant loss or what we thought was significant loss in public lands. So we did a little bit of an investigation that of why we were losing native cover in public lands, which you would think that these, the loss should not be significant. Yeah. Anyways, so we looked at that, we talked about we talked to a number of uh, agrologists uh, in the Parkland region specifically because that's where we saw the loss more significant or more prominent. And it's um, it's a number of factors. Uh, there is still some conversion from native cover to agriculture in some cases, at least that's what we got from the agrologists that we talked to. There is also industrial development that goes on continuously. In some cases, it's more prominent. For example, when there's a new pipeline, for example, the, um, the Trans Mountain pipe, pipe, not Trans Mountain, what was it called? The, oh, I forget, the one that was, that was yeah. Yeah, shut Trans down. Boundary. Yeah. Yes, Trans Boundary, yes. So for example, th those the, the creation of that pipeline will disturb the landscape. And you're probably seeing that disturbed light landscape in some of the, uh, the public lands that we were looking at. There's a variety of factors. Okay. Yeah. Also, we were wondering, you know, like why is there, um, and, you know, and when you look at the report, I didn't show it in these graphs, but in the report, it shows, um, let's say in the parkland, for example, some 70% of the parkland public land is native. So, well, how come 30% then? of public land is non-native in public lands in the parkland, right? And some of the factors that I mentioned, plus, you know, the the sensor that's used, the mostly Landsat, this is the, the data that's coming in from uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, is taking in a lot of these road easements and uh, the roads themselves and the easement areas and so on, and they accumulate to quite a, quite a bit, quite a, quite a, significant amount to produce okay. almost 30 percent of that landscape okay yeah yeah i could see that adding up yeah okay all right thank you very much livio i, I appreciate um, the update neil there are a few questions okay for livio if we have some time yeah. um one of maybe maybe a question maybe a comment is some of the lack of native prairie left maybe the rate is slowing down because we don't have as much to lose anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, I would say that that's a valid comment in the parkland. There is uh, around 20% native left in the parkland. Most of that is in um, some of these areas that are non non-agricultural areas or on CFB Wainwright. So parkland is significantly constrained, I agree. Okay, and then another question for you. Uh, the loss of absolute surface area is declining. However, what is the trend in the percentage of loss? So are we losing less because the total surface area is smaller and smaller? So there's smaller absolute amount to be lost. I think that's kind of the same thing as what Ben was saying. So I think you answered that already. <laughs> I I think so. Maybe if you can repeat the the question again. I'm not I don't think I caught it. Completely. It's the the loss of absolute surface area is declining. However, what is the trend in the percentage of loss? 
the trend and percentage of loss. Hmm. I mean, the percentages that I'm presenting in the grass, in, in, in the grassland and parkland, are always of the total area. So we look at the total area of native cover in 1990, for example, and then we look at the percentage of native cover in 2020. So uh, those are absolute numbers. Uh, they're not comparable between them because they're individual data sets in 1990, 2000, 2010, 2020. So they stand on their own and the figures are what they are. The, the, the native cover in 1990 and the native cover in 2020, say for example. So that's what you're seeing. You're not seeing interactions between them, if that's the inference of the of the question. Is, is am I answering that correctly? Or at least I'm dress, no. addressing that. Yep, Bradamir, if you have any further um, comments on that, please let us know. Uh, and then Christiane just uh, says thank you for your presentation. Excellent as oh. always. <laughs> and that's that's all I have unless unless Brandomir has more that he would like to say. Well, I, I would say to everyone, just you know, in a few months we'll have the complete report. So by May, June, and it'll be a lot more detailed and it'll probably answer a lot of these questions. Yeah, for sure. Um one more question. Yeah. Do we keep track of hectares that are lost as well as hectares that are reclaimed back to native? That's a good question, very good question. And um, the best way to answer for that is that the quality of the data that we have, um, I, it doesn't have the resolution for us to look at loss and recovery. And that's because of the error in the data. We've done this analysis way back when we were doing the original part, report where we were you know, we were somewhat surprised to see the amount of area that was recovered. I'll call it recovered. And that's that's because the remote sensing platform showed the data that was once disturbed and now it seems to be native. But we're not sure about the reliability of that information. So we do see it. But there's there's error in the information, and we're not sure whether what we're seeing is real or an artifact of error in the data. I mean, to really check it out is to know the landscape, to know what's happened in 1990, for example, and to have gone back there uh, 30 years later and says, oh yeah, this was a section or a quarter section or whatever it is, you know, that we know re uh, was recovered, and you know, how is it showing up? in the remote sensing platform as a recovered area. Is it showing up, in fact, as a recovered area? Okay, thanks, Olivia. I think it, that's it for questions. Yeah, it's, it, on that question, it's one of those things that, you know, you need to follow up. And what we do is um, we don't have the resources to follow up a lot of that because it takes a significant amount of field work to do that. I, I would say look at these data sets in their uh, large scale viewability. You know, when we look at that data set as the biome, as the natural region, that's the level that we're looking at that data set. When we start looking at things at a quarter section level or even more detailed, you know, you know, let's say for the 30 meter pixels of which these Landsat sensors provide information. And I think you're getting into, uh, you're going down a rabbit's hole, you know, into error of in the data. So the more general, generalized the data is, probably the more reliable it is. The error, the error evens out. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Livio. Yeah, yep, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank really you, everyone. Appreciate that. Good. Um, all right, I uh, I get to do the board of directors update. Uh, before I do that, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Livio and everybody that's worked on all of these different committees. 
Um, really appreciate it. Um, and if you're uh, if you're wanting to to help out with with anything anything piqued your interest on on any of these updates, um, please reach out to uh, to Catherine and let her know that you'd like to join, and uh, she'll get you the contact information for it. Uh, so I'm going to do the the board of directors update. I was trying to figure that out last night. It's been a busy year again, um, and and my notes are always sketchy at best. Um, so it started off uh, fairly quick with the new board, um, and many TCF members were involved in the uh, the Prairie Conference and in day or. Prairie Conservation Endangered Species Conference in Calgary. Um, and I, I just have to add that it was uh, very cold. Um, just, just for everyone that told me last weekend was the coldest they could ever remember it. Um, Nolan and I were on the ski hill and we couldn't, they shut the hills down. So I know it was cold that weekend. Um, so that went off um, with a lot of help from the PCF. Um, and other other folks uh, all around the province and it was very successful from what i understand um the board had four meetings uh throughout the year one one in-person meeting um to try and work out our our work plan um the beginning of the year in lethbridge and the rest ended up being virtual just because we're spread out all over the place and it was easier to uh to do this rather than drive for three hours. Uh, we've had board members have been involved with every committee and trying to move, move our work plan forward towards fulfilling the latest PCAP. Um, and also the one of our, our biggest conversations that we've had at all of the meetings of the board was how to re-engage our membership. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just so pumped. We got 45 people on online today. Uh, it, it's great. I can't see you, but it, it's good to have that many people out. Um, we haven't had 45 people out for uh, since before everything got shut down. Um, so what what we came up with? That's why we're doing virtual today, um, rather than having everybody fighting weather to get. To meet in Okotoks, we decided that we would uh, hold it, hold it virtual, the AGM virtual again this year, um, and and hopefully in June we're going to have a, a bigger bigger event. We'll have a summer meeting and tour in June, or uh, or September event, which will hopefully be big enough to draw draw folks in um, and and attend it. So uh, that's that's what I have. For uh, for a board update, um, the last I guess I should I should mention that um, we have been busy um, in the last last three weeks, um, busy doing through going through a hiring process right now. Um, for anybody that hasn't heard, Sasha will be. Uh, We'll be moving on, and uh, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say where you're moving on, but you're going to be at Salt, so she's she's not leaving, but she is leaving us. So, uh, so we've been been doing that, and we're still in that process right now. So, um, we'll let you know how how things turn out there. Okay, so now we're gonna do our elections. Um, we have a list, and I am turning it over to Catherine to to run this this section. If well, I guess she has to do it. I'm I'm done. I'm out. There you go, Catherine. Yeah, it sounds good, Neil. Um, I'm gonna just leave my video off so that you guys can see the screen a little bit better. But obviously, why we want to do a big thank you to the 2023-2024 Board of Directors. Um, that's who they are right there and i'll read their names out out again in a second here if you can go to the next slide sasha 
Yeah, so as far as outgoing board members, Neil and Christiane have both uh, served their six years, so they're allowed a maximum of three terms. Terms are two years each, and so they have both done that. And just a huge thank you to them for, for the commitment that they've uh, put forward to the, the PCF. And of course, Neil has been chair for the PCF for the last three years, so thank you to Neil for that. And Len, of course, Len with the Calgary Zoo has been a great addition to the board and we're sad to see him go. But as you will see, we do have a new nomination from there. So if you can, next slide, Sasha. So as far as elections go, we have a maximum of 15 board members that are allowed to be on the PCF board as per our bylaws. Uh, we currently have eight out of 15 positions filled. So these are our current board members that have agreed to stay on. So I'll just run through that list quickly here. Uh, the first is Alvin First Rider with, with the Blood Tribe Land Management. So representing the category of First Nations. Uh, we've got Benjamin Meisner with Land Resource Industry. He's a, a consultant. So he is uh, agreed to stay on. We have Everett Hanna who is um, an instructor at the Lethbridge College uh, in the academia category. Megan Jensen with the Nature Conservancy of Canada, who is in the environmental category. Nolan Ball with special areas uh, representing municipal government. Peg Strankman, who is our current PCF treasurer, uh, land resource industry. Riley Hewitt, Southern Alberta Land Trust Society, environmental. And Stefano Licchioli with the Alberta Environment and Protected Areas with the provincial government. So thank you to all of you that have agreed to stay on. If something is wrong there, please let me know, but we welcome you back to the board to continue working on our action plans. So brought forward before this meeting, we have two nominations. So we have Graham Dixon Callum with the Wilder Institute. Um, so again, from the Calgary Zoo, uh, which would fill the tourism category, and Doug Ray, who is a rancher near Iracana and would fill in the agricultural category. So we do still have some space. Uh, our environmental category is filled, and our land resource industry category is filled, but there is space in all of the remaining uh, categories. So First Nations, Provincial, Federal and Municipal Government, Academia, Tourism, Agricultural and Individuals. So with that, I am going to open up nominations to the floor. Um, if you have somebody you would like to nominate or would like to nominate yourself, you can uh, either put up your hand, I think, or, or put it down in the, the question panel. And so I'll run through the call for nominations three times. Okay. So, Catherine? Yep. Yeah. Excuse me, Catherine. Um, I think we need to have Graham and Doug accept the nominations um, in the meeting. Right. That would be okay. good. Okay, we can do that before we open nominations then. So, uh, maybe we can unmute them. Starting Graham, with Graham. Yeah. Uh, yep, hi, I'm here. And yes, I accept. Excellent. Thank you. And then, and then Doug. Doug Ray here. Yeah, I accept. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so that is our, our two nominations so far, and I will now open nominations to the floor. So is there anybody that would like to nominate another person or themselves to the PCF Board of Directors? And I'll give you a second. Okay. Doesn't look like there is, oh wait, hold on, Riley. Okay, Riley, I'm gonna unmute you. Go ahead. 
Sorry about that, Catherine. Um, can I That's nominate? Okay. <laughs> of course, right? Obviously, I haven't been talking. I'm just sitting here in silence. <laughs> um, can I nominate Sarah Goodman as an individual? Absolutely. Okay, so Sarah. So now I'm going to go over to you, Sarah, <laughs> and unmute you if I can. Wait, hold on a second. Oh, I think you're self muted. Sarah, if you can. Let us know if you would like the, the nomination to stand. Or let us know in the question box. I think you have to unmute yourself, Sarah. Yes, okay. So Sarah says yes, she would like that to stand. Okay, I will open it again to the floor. Is there anybody that would like to nominate themselves or another person to the PCF Board of Directors? Okay, not seeing anybody. So that's the third and final time, last chance. It's really fun, you won't, you won't regret it. <laughs> So third and final chance, if you would like to nominate yourself or, or another person to the PCF board, please let us know by raising your hand or typing into the question box. All right. I'm not... I am not seeing anything. Um, Stefano's asking if later nominations would be accepted. I think it would have to be fairly quickly. I'm not really sure what the protocol is for that. Or you can nominate someone now and we can um, wait for their approval, especially if they're not in attendance today. Stefano, is there somebody that you would like to nominate? Um, not now. I was just asking. I uh, need some time to think about it, I guess. But thank okay. you for the answer. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I will then close nominations and welcome the new PCF board for 2024, 2025. Thank you, everyone. Perfect. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you to the new board. Um, I appreciate, appreciate everybody stepping forward um, to continue on. Um, I need to ask, ask the, the new board to please stay on um, after after this call. Um, you guys will have a, a quick meeting here. Um, and I'll, I'll try and remember to, to remind you again. Um, so I'm gonna do the introductions of, of our guest speakers. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing these presentations. So um, Paul Jones, is a senior biologist with the Alberta Conservation Association, a not-for-profit, non-government registered charity. Um, it's largely funded by Alberta's hunters and anglers through license levies and a growing number of corporate partners. It's been with the Alberta Conservation Association for 25 years, of which the last 20 years or so he has studied pronghorn. He has authored or co-authored 27 peer-reviewed publications, of which most are on pronghorn, has authored a book chapter on pronghorn, co-authored two additional book chapters, and given numerous times at conferences, workshops, and to the general public promoting the conservation of pronghorn. Uh, Paul was also a co-author at the latest version of the North American Pronghorn Management Guides and the Pronghorn Bibliography that was published by uh, WAFWA in uh, in 2016, Paul received two special recognition awards at the Pronghorn Workshop for his efforts to conserve pronghorn. 
And last year, Paul was awarded the Prairie Conservationist Award for Alberta at the 13th Prairie Conservation and Endangered Species Conference for his work on pronghorn and the multi-star program. He has a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Lethbridge and a Master of Science degree from the University of Alberta. And he's going to present today on the ghosts of predators past, spirits of perseverance, present, and shadows of a fragile future, the pronghorn antelope by Paul Jones. Thank you for uh, for joining us, Paul. Thanks, Neil, for that introduction. I just want to check, can everyone hear me? Yep, yeah, I can hear you yep. well, and I can see your... Uh... You can see my slides? Yep. Okay, perfect, and I will get going. Again, thanks, Neil, for the introduction, okay. and thank you, everyone, for attending this talk. Um, so I kind of have a unique title um, to my presentation, and kind of where it sort of come from is, I was in Yellowstone last summer and I, I bought a pronghorn print by an, an artist named Barbara Schelling. And she's actually a member of the Nakoda tribe based in Fort Belknap, Montana. And she simply called it pronghorn, but then she gave it a unique description. And her description was simply states, sometimes his story is tragic and sometimes his story is heroic. And that's sort of the basis for my, my presentation today is I'm gonna run you through the story of the pronghorn. And it's really three parts. The first part is Ghosts of Predator Pass, which will look at sort of the archaeological history of pronghorn in North America. And then we'll kind of move on to Spirits of Persevere and Presence, which is kind of look at the story of the pronghorn in sort of modern North America from European settlement until, you know, present day where, I, you know, I started working on pronghorn. And then the last one is sort of shadows of the fragile future, where I'll kind of just sort of postulate on what the future of pronghorn in North America may hold. So if we really want to start the story of the pronghorn, we kind of got to look at the archaeological record. And the first sort of record of pronghorn in the fossil record was during the Miocene epoch, which is about 8.8 .8 to 18.5 million years ago. And it was from the subfamily Mericondontinae, or as they're sort of known as the pronglets. So it's sort of seen here, this is sort of the pronglet in comparison to modern North American pronghorn. So they are about 20 inches at the shoulder and only half the size of a modern pronghorn, and they only weighed 26 to 44 pounds, and it was the only the males that had horns. And sadly, at the sort of the end of the Miocene, they sort of went extinct. But they led to the family or genus Antelocaprinae, or the pronghorn bucks, which sort of appeared about 14 million years ago in the archaeological record, but they were most prominent about 7 million years ago. And there was two main genuses, Cephalopholus, which was about 14 to 4 million years ago, and the species in this genus were either smaller or similar in size to the modern pronghorn, but had multiple forked horns, and some even had twisted horns. And then the second genus was Tratomerix, which is, appeared about 4 million years ago, and they lasted till about a thousand years ago. And they were four horned, as you can sort of see here, you can see this sort of the main front horns, which looks like a regular pronghorn, but then they had this second set of horns in behind. So they were the, the four horned pronghorns. And it's believed one of these two genuses gave rise to the modern pronghorn, uh, which first appeared about a million years ago. And there's sort of two species that were in this genus Antelocapra. The first one is Antelocapra americana, or a modern pronghorn. And the second one was Antelocapra pacificus, which actually went extinct. But the unique feature of this is the last ice age, which was occurred about 11,000 years ago, or when sort of the transition from the Pleistocene to the Holocene happened, the modern pronghorn actually survived that ice age extinction. So while woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers and dire wolves were, were going extinct, the modern pronghorn survived. And they are actually endemic to North America, to the plains of North America, and they're not found anywhere else. And while a lot of people think of them as antelope um, from when Europeans first settled North America, they're actually not genetically related to any of the antelope in Africa. 
they're actually mostly genetically related to the giraffe of Africa. And if you kind of look at this picture, you can sort of see some similarities in terms of like, you know, the placement of the eyes and the eyelashes, the sort of the, the narrow face, the nose, and then this is a doe. But if you look at a pronghorn book, you could sort of see, you know, the horn placement. And really it's their evolutionary history that sort of led to some anatomical specializations that created the modern pronghorn. And a, a fellow named Tom McKean, he did a comparison study between pronghorn and the domestic goat. Um, even though they're not related, they're some of similar size, though the pronghorn is a lot faster. And what he found is the heart of the pronghorn is, is twice as large as that as the, the goat. In their blood, sorry, uh, the blood has 50% more blood, 60% more hemoglobin, and 33% more red blood cells. And then lastly, the windpipe of the pronghorn is, as he called it, about the size of a vacuum cleaner hose, which is a lot larger than the domestic goat. And these features are all important because they help deliver oxygen to running muscles. Um, essentially, the pronghorn's VO2 measure of oxygen consumption far exceeds that of an animal that weighs about 100 pounds. In addition, one of the anatomical um, specializations is their long legs and their lower limbs which is about nine inches long and their bone size is about the size of your index finger so really small but this allows them to generate speed when they're running and it's believed that this speed is the result of the north american cheetah so they were trying to avoid north american cheetahs that down and when they were first in the holocene area and nowadays that you know the north american cheetah has gone extinct but they still keep that trait of being able to run fast and really as dr byers put it um, he called them the pronghorn of the ghost of the predator past because cheetahs were around and now they're gone but they still have maintained the speed and partly how they do that is through their reproductive system. So one of the interesting things about the pronghorn's reproductive system is that females choose the male that they want to breed with. And one way to do that, and you can sort of see it here in this image um, that I took this past fall in Saskatchewan, is the females test the males and their ability uh, to run fast. So what a female will do is, um, if she wants to test her male, she'll try to run away as fast as she can and she wants to see if that buck can catch up to her and turn her around and bring her back to the herd and keep her with them. And then if he can, then she'll breed with him in likelihood. If he can, she'll actually leave the herd and look and seek another male to see if he's a suitable suitor. And in this case, you can kind of see it here, there's this sort of horizon here in the picture. And this female was bedded down between, just off the road and on the other side of the fence, and this male was tending her. And as we stopped to take pictures of them, the female got up and she ran. And she actually got over out of sight behind this horizon here. But he was able to turn her around and then drive her back towards the road, where then they eventually bedded down again. So she was actually testing this male to see if he's suitable or not. And now we're kind of going to jump into sort of the spirit of perseverance presence. And I'm going to kind of look at sort of two time frames, the 1800s and 1900s in North America, and then into the 2000s when I started working on pronghorn. And it's going to sort of highlight, highlight how pronghorn have persevered in a much changing environment and how some of the evolutionary past traits have helped them. And if you're kind of interested, this archive here is from the Ger Gerald B. Ranch in southern Alberta. So for most people, the story of modern North America starts with European settlement of the West. And for most, the story centers around the near extinction of bison. But sort of forgotten or in the distance past is the role that Plonkhorn had and their conservation story. So if you think about it, bison numbered somewhere between their estimating you know, 30 to 60 million at one point, and they were nearly extirpated between 1800 and 1885. So now the sort of the bison population, which I sort of got a number from 2010, ranged from 400,000 to 500,000, uh, with approximately 20,500 of those animals in 62 conservation herds, and the remaining approximately 6,400 um, are commercial herds. 
And I think IUCN roughly estimates that 15,000 bison are considered wild, free-ranging bison and not confined by fencing or considered domestic livestock. So yes, we've stopped bison from going extinct, but we haven't been able to return them to sort of the, their pre-European settlement of free roaming animals. And one of the things I have, I always try to do is sort of bring the pronghorn to the forefront of conservation in North America. You know, it's sort of said that the pronghorn numbers were either equal to or greater than those of the bison during pre-European settlement. And then also sadly, pronghorn were nearly extirpated between the 1900s and 1950s. So pronghorn be, sort of has become one of these forgotten conservation story, stories of North America. And I think it's sort of time that we brought this story to the forefront and sort of made people aware of that. You know, what we've done for pronghorn allows them to be free ranging um, here in North America. So partly the reason why they almost went extinct um, was because of unregulated harvest. As hunters switched when bison numbers were getting low, they switched to pronghorn as a for food storage for the settlers that were coming out. They are also because of the breaking of the native prairie by sodbusters, so changing the habitat from native prairie, which they rely on to croplands. And then as part of it, they brought cattle out west and then they started fencing to control the domestic livestock. And at the time, pronghorn didn't know how to deal with fences because they'd never seen a fence before during their evolutionary history. And then lastly, there was sort of direct competition with domestic sheep for forage. At one point, it was estimated that there was 40 million sheep in the 11 Western states. So direct competition for forage. I mean, in between 1909 and 1910, we sort of started to conserve pronghorn and started establishing you know, farms and national parks to help raise pronghorn and then release them back into the wild. So in 1910, the Alberta provincial government authorized capture of pronghorn for Banff National Park and Wainwright Buffalo Park. And then uniquely in 1940, the Waskanisi National Park and in 1950, the Nemiskam National Park were established. And they were actually established for refugia for pronghorn that were used for source populations, free introductions. And these two national parks kind of went against the norm of what national parks were established. If you think about Banff and Jasper, those national parks were established for tourism to bring people out to see the splendor of the Rockies and its wildlife. Whereas these parks were not tourism destinations, they were actually established for conservation needs. And then the other unique thing in Alberta was in 1920, the provincial government gave permits to CJ Blazer to establish a pronghorn farm near Lake Newell. And it was pronghorn from this farm that were relocated throughout Alberta, but also sent into the US to help establish populations down there as well. So it was really the efforts of the landowners, ranchers and hunters who gave up the right to hunt that helped sort of bring back the pronghorn from near extinction. So I just kind of want to give you the numbers here. So for Alberta's pronghorn, it was estimated that our provincial population in the early 1900s was down to about a thousand animals. And it was um, that, at that time where they stopped hunting um, due to low population numbers. And the population started to slowly increase again. And it was the efforts of those reintroductions from the national parks as well as the landowners and rancher there. Um, so it kind of peaked for Alberta in about 1984, where we had 32,000. And it sort of declined after that for because of a series of major winters uh, and major die-offs. Um, but I think re realistically now in the modern age, so you know I've got the last figure here is 2011, but going up, I think we sit at around 18 to 20,000, unless we have a major winter and we have a die-off, where then, then it takes a while to rebound. But a similar has happened in North America in terms of their population. So I, I've read one estimate that around the 1900s, we went from like 30 to 60 million down to about a thousand animals. And then it's sort of slowly increased in 1924. Uh, there was 30,000 animals North American wide. And then it slowly steady increased, you know, up to 1968, just over 386,000. And it peaked in 1984 at just under a million animals. 
So if you think about it, that's a significant increase. And these animals are free ranging. They're not domestic. And they're not technically behind fences as domestic animals, but free ranging animals. And then in 2006 is where we sort of hit our highest peak of just over 1.1 million across North America. And I'm not sure where we're at right now. I'll hopefully find out this coming summer at the next biannual pronghorn workshop. But I'm guessing we're a lot less you know, given all of the major die-offs that happened last winter in Wyoming where at least half of the population um, is occurs. So we've been able to really recover pronghorn to what they, in some ways, smaller than they were historically, but they're free ranging species. And we need to celebrate that. And then I'm kind of gonna jump ahead now to sort of the 2000 and my involvement with pronghorn. So these are sort of two images from the initial work that, that really helped focus my career and kind of got me into the pronghorn world. So this image here on the left is a movement track of one of our collared pronghorns and I'll go into depth um, of her movement. And then the second, this is an image captured of one of our collared animals um, during the neck gunning phase, um, which sort of really shocked us when we seen this image. So we began a, a GPS collar study in 2003, uh, where we were putting uh, GPS store on board collars that would collect a location every four hours. And it was a partnership between ACA, the University of Calgary and Alberta Fish and Wildlife at the time. And then one of the animals we captured was, as we call her, P3, which was one very special doe. And this is her this is her movement track. This is the image I just showed you. So she was initially collared down in that many berries south part of the province um, in December of 2003. And then she moved just after collaring about two weeks later up to this area here near sort of many berries. And that's where she sort of spent the winter. And then come March, she totally disappeared off of our radar. We had no idea where she went. And thank goodness for a oil and gas worker in Saskatchewan that saw her across him in front of the road and phoned Fish and Wildlife and said, hey, I just seen a pronghorn with a collar that we were able to track her down and recover a collar. And this is sort of her movement path. So from March, 2004, she moved north and then hit the Trans-Canada Highway to the east of Medicine Hat. And she actually spent three days moving back and forth on the south side of the highway before she was actually successfully able to cross the highway and continue her path north. And then she moved sort of up through Suffield um, into Saskatchewan. Um, and then she actually came back into Alberta and had, during the fawning period, was here, just north of Oyen. And we're not sure if she actually successfully fawned or if she fawned and then lost her fawns. But then after that, she decided to make a trek back into Saskatchewan, and that's where she spent her summer. So over that time period, which is roughly about three weeks, she moved 445 kilometers, including three days at the Trans-Canada Highway. And then at the end of the summer, she made her spring migration south and actually dropped her collar the following December on CFB Suffield. So in total, she moved 842 kilometers in about a 52 week period. And that's sort of a record for North American pronghorn in terms of distance moved. And during this sort of migration movement pattern, she crossed 13 major highways and three river crossings. So it was sort of just eye opening in terms of the movement that these animals can make across this landscape for us. And it kind of led to this sort of, um, connectivity map that we developed. Um, so here you can sort of see in blue, this is from the work in the 70s and 80s of where we thought pronghorn moved in terms of their migration. So sort of from the Brooks area down into almost the Saskatchewan border to the east of Medicine Hat, and then sort of a little bit north south here near Tabor. And then based on our analysis, it's our, our data, this is where we're seeing pronghorn moving, um, very much north south connectivity. And it really highlighted the fact that our population of pronghorn in Alberta are part of a meta population with connections into Montana. We actually had one animal that went south during a spring migration into Montana, as well as in and out of Saskatchewan. 
And it also highlighted the key linkage areas, we call it, around the city of Medicine Hat, where animals have to try navigate Highway 1 here or Highway 3 and Highway 1 if they go this way. And just kind of just highlights it here, the road, the pronghorn getting hung up at the fence and the highway. And then also once they cross the highway, then they have to get across the railway tracks as well, which are, are fenced on both sides. So it's a really major key linkage area or pinch point along their migration path. But one of the things that we found that was unique with our pronghorn, so when we compared it to, let's say, the, the fall and spring migrations of mule deer in Wyoming, where their mule deer are basically walking on the same path and all of their migration paths overlap, our pronghorn make unique movements when they're doing south. So this is our first year, 2004 spring migration, and you can see animals kind of do, doing different places and ending up at different places. This is sort of 2006 spring, uh, sorry, five migration where we had animals leaving CFB Suffield and moving to different areas, some into Saskatchewan, some north of Brooks and Anna. A similar pattern here in, 2000, in the spring of 2006 where animals again moved off of um, CFB Suffield. Most went, stayed in Alberta. We had one animal that went into Saskatchewan. But then also the other unique thing is this is the fall migrations for all three years that we had had collars on a pronghorn in Alberta. And all of those that migrated south ended up on CFB Suffield. So it really highlights the importance of CFB Suffield as a staging area or a potential wintering area, depending on what kind of winter we're having. And then we're gonna kind of switch gears to sort of the, the as I call it, the next phase of the pronghorn work uh, that we did. So here's that image I showed you before of that one captured animals. And we started looking at, at this animal and figuring like what really caused this? And really the conclusion we came to this is, is this is from this animal crossing under a number of fences and the barbs on the bottom wire scraping the hair off their back. And what we think has happened is because of the cold temperatures, these areas have become frostbitten because there's, the hair has been removed because of that fence. And these are areas where, you know, infection could set in or and weaken this animal. So it kind of led to us starting a study on, on fences. And at the time when we started, um, even though fences are commonplace across North America, and they play an important role for, you know, marking property boundaries, you know, controlling the distribution of livestock. And they also protect us from collisions with wildlife as well as livestock on the roads and highways that we travel. Um, but really, no one was thinking about in terms of, well, what is this impact of this fence on wildlife? There'd been a, one conference in Africa or Australia that had kind of looked at it, but it was not mainstream. No one was really thinking about what is the, the impact of fences. So we, I partnered kind of with Dr. Andrew Jakes and some other colleagues, Chris Page, Renee Seidler, and Mark Heuer. And we published a paper calling A Fence Runs Through It, a greater call for attention to the influence of fences on wildlife ecosystems in biological conservation. And really it's kind of one of those papers that have sort of led to a change in the way we look at the landscape. Fences are no, no more invisible to people, but people are considering them in terms of their impact to animal movements and to animal health. And I just kind of want to give you an idea in terms of the scope we're looking at. So we mapped fence lines in Alberta using imagery. And we mapped them for 630 townships in sort of south, southern Alberta, basically from the Montana border, Saskatchewan on the east side all the way up. And for that, we kind of figured the average is about 106 kilometers of fence line per township. And it kind of put it in perspective. So the circumference of the earth is 40,000 kilometers. So the fence lines that we mapped would actually circle the earth 1.6 times. That's how many fences are out there in just a part of Alberta. And then if you think about it, most of our fences are four strand. So we have enough fences wire out there in Alberta to circle the earth 6.4 times. So let's now think about it. What does that actually mean for pronghorn in Alberta? And here's just two examples. So this is a pronghorn number one that was collared in December of 2003. And she made over her 52 weeks that we had the collar on her, 666 crossings, which isn't bad when you compare her to pronghorn 64. 
um, that was collared in March of 2006. And that animal made over a thousand crossings in the 52 weeks that her collar was on. So you think about it, these are astronomical crossings and you can kind of see why they potentially lose hair by going over that number of fences. And then I've been working with the Mustakis Institute and using a, a package called BABA, um, which is an R package that classifies fence interaction behaviors. And there's sort of three main categories, normal, altered, and trapped. So the normal behaviors are basically average movements or successful crosses. And then altered or bounce when they hit the fence and then leaves the fence or um, trace where they sort of hit the fence and then they'll follow it and then go back and forth as well. They have the three behaviors in altered or trapped where they get into an area and they can't seem to escape. And for us, it's like something like 66% of our interactions when we use our GPS caller data from actually Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Montana fall in that normal category. And roughly 33% are in this altered behavior and then only a small percentage are entrapped. But one of the things I do also want to point out is even though we have sort of this high percentage of normal behaviors, you kind of have to remember that our GPS relocation schedule was four hours. So while it might appear that an animal successfully, you know, crossed the fence during that four hours, it doesn't mean that that animal didn't have to follow a fence along before it crossed. So there's sort of back and forth or trace um, of the fence before it successfully crossed. So I think in some ways this is an overestimate of the normal animal behaviors. So what does it mean for a pronghorn? Do I cross or don't I cross? So here's just some metrics. So on average, an animal will cross 1.4 crossings per day. And then on average, it'll be like 511 crossings per year. And if we average an age of a female pronghorn is about nine years, it's gonna make over 4,500 crossings in its lifetime. And you sort of see, um, if we go to the extreme, then some of the animals are crossing four times a day. 1,460 crossings per year or over 13,000 uh, crossings in its lifetime. And you can sort of see some of the, the remnants of those crossings. This is sort of one of our worst case scenarios where you can see on, its ne on her neck, all of the hair has been removed and you can actually see where the barbs have actually scraped the skin underneath. Here you can sort of see where this animal likely crossed the fence fairly fast and it stripped all of the hair right along its back. And here's an example that we caught um, with a camera from National Geographic of an animal crossing under a fence. And you can sort of see here the actual hair loss that's happening. So uh, from a pronghorn perspective, is uh, fence crossing the hair raising experience, or as I say, crossing fences is a hair losing experience. And I'll kind of give you an example of that. Here's a, a video that we captured of three pronghorn crossing. The first one makes it not too bad. And you can sort of see here her fawn is trying to cross, but is a little unsure of whether it should cross it and, and how, how it can cross, but it does successfully cross. And then for some reason, this third animal is gonna come flying into the picture. And you can see the, the dramatic hair loss um, that's happened at this site. I even have from uh, some of our camera trap work, um, I collected hair samples and I can fill a, a Ziploc bag over a one month period of hair um, at the site that's been lost by pronghorn. So now you can imagine doing that, you know, a hundred times or a thousand times over your lifetime, what, what the, the consequences are. Um, so they sort of transitioned me into this new phase where, you know, there's proposed solutions to make fences wildlife friendly. One, the goat bar here where you put a PVC pipe and clip the two wires together to make it easier for pronghorn to get under. Because as opposed to deer, pronghorn prefer not to jump. It's like 99% of the camera images we got where a pronghorn going under. And that's, I think, an evolutionary trait of, of living on the prairies and not having high structures where they evolved to jump. They, so when they hit the first fence, the evolution made them go under. The other way is we came up with this idea of using quick links or carabiners to clip the wires together. The third one we looked at was smooth wire on the bottom. And then lastly, just even op leaving open gates. But one of the things we asked is ourselves, yeah, they're in these guys, but are they effective? So we wanted to test that from a pronghorn perspective, but then we also looked at it from a deer perspective as well. But one of the things that we did find um, is I did a comparison of the bottom wire height before we did any modifications at the sites where pronghorn were successfully crossing versus where they could have crossed 
for where they attempted to cross. And if you look here, so this is the number of events and here's the bottom wire height in inches. And you can really see there's a big jump from going, you know, anything below 17 inches is the attempt, but very little success. And also at 18 inches, we see this huge jump of success as well as attempts. And based on this analysis and our publication of it, it's sort of now become the gold standard across North America to, if you're doing wildlife friendly fencing with pronghorn in mind, you do, do it at 18 inches is the minimum bottom wire height. And then one of the other things we found out is pronghorn really have a spatial memory of the landscape and fences and areas where they cross. So one of the things we found out is a pronghorn walking along a fence is not necessarily looking for a place to cross, but it's actually looking for the place it knows it can cross. They'll, they'll just follow a fence line and then get to a certain spot and then quickly cross. So they have the spatial memory of where these locations are. And I'm, we're guessing it's you know passed down from generation to generation. And then sort of based on our results, we kind of put it into, you know, everyone asked the million dollar question is, is how should I modify fences or what's the best way to modify fences? And sort of at the pinnacle of, of this triangle, we put known crossings. These are almost like resources for pronghorn. These are areas where they're gonna travel to where they know they can cross. So if you can maintain those or even enhance those, that's sort of the best. And then below it is doing this smooth wire at 18 inches on the bottom, because you get the added benefit of not having those barbs. So when animals cross and if there's any snow and they're pushing up on the wire, the barbs don't strip the wire because they're not there because it's double-stranded smooth wire. And then below that, we put sort of these clips because you kind of lose that added benefit of the, the barbs are still there, but they still does do passage. And then lastly, goat bar, which we found was interesting because goat bar is sort of named after pronghorn, who our American colleagues have a nickname for pronghorn of being speed goats. So when they put the PVC pipe up, they call them goat bars. But we found that there was some sort of adverse behavior reactions from pronghorn to it. They didn't actually seem to like the white. And what we find is when we had successful crossings at a goat bar site, they didn't actually go under the goat bar. So they lost the benefit of the barbs being encased in the plastic. They would actually cross off the end of it where the wire was still raised enough. So we sort of put that as at the bottom of the, the pyramid and sort of don't suggest using it. So then I'm kind of going to move now into the sort of the last phase of my talk called shadows of a fragile future. So kind of looking into, into what may happen for pronghorn across the range as well as in North America. And I'm sure everyone um, who's been enjoying this great weather that we've been having would love a day at the beach, sort of like these pronghorn, but pronghorn aren't adapted to being at the beach. So for pronghorn, really their evolutionary trait that we see today is their ability to move. So they want to surf the green wave, right? So they want to be able to track those resources as during the spring when the vegetation is greening up to maximize nutritional intake. And we've found that this promotes nutritional gain, higher survival rates, as well as reproductive success. And then the other one is, as I call it, surfing the white wave. So this is the fall migration being able to move in response to environmental, changing environmental conditions, to escape those severe winters and being able to move south to more hospitable conditions. But what may be coming in our future if, if predictions of global warming happen is, is this heat wave and how are pronghorn gonna serve the heat wave as temperatures get hotter and as drought conditions become more prevalent. So I, I borrowed this this map here from Bean et al. That was looking at you know the animals in southern part of the range compared to north, and it, it really stood out to me in terms of animals at the southern part of the pronghorn range deal with more heat and more drought conditions. So these are animals in like Texas and Arizona and New Mexico and Mexico, and then you sort of transition up through the core area of pronghorn where it sort of changes, and animals are more adapted to the cold environments, including here in Alberta. Um, but there's been some very interesting studies that are going on of late. One is populations in the south here, so Mexico and, and Texas, are not doing as well as our northern populations. They're barely hanging on in some areas. For example, the Sonoran pronghorn is now listed as endangered. It's a subspecies of, of the American pronghorn, are listed as 
is endangered. And in the areas in Texas, in the Trans-Pecos area, they've now uh, started using translocation of animals from the Texas Panhandle to try booster populations in those areas. And then there's also been a study in the um, Great Basin area of Nevada, Oregon, Idaho, and Utah by Zeller et al. that was looking at what is, could be the potential impacts of climate change to pronghorn. And Kathy and her team concluded that under two different sort of scenarios of climate change, whether we see a plus two degrees or a plus four degrees increase in temperature, um, that by 2070, we will see significant reductions in pronghorn habitat in this area, but more importantly, the connectivity substantially decreases. Um, so then what's, you know, we don't really know, but in likelihood that will have impacts on pronghorn populations in this area. And then I just finished reading a paper um, last week, and I wanna kind of highlight this because it's the most disturbing um, paper that I've read in terms of for pronghorn, and that is some work done in Wyoming uh, by Dr. Donovan and a colleague of mine, Jeff Beck at the University of Wyoming. And they were looking at um, a period of 1984, sorry, to 2019, what the pronghorn productivity rates were for this area and if there was changes in those. And what they found is that Wyoming is experiencing long-term declines in productivity. And she attributed the decline to sort of two main um, factors. One was the increase in oil and gas development that's happened in Wyoming, as well as tree encroachment into the sagebrush staff habitat. And this is really significant because Wyoming is home to at least half of North America's population. If you think about it, out of that 1 million pop estimate um, back in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, half of those animals are in Wyoming. And if we're seeing declines in productivity, so juveniles per 100 females, that's significant in terms of what it may mean for North Americans population. Um, and then let's now kind of switch back to, to Alberta and what the future may hold for pronghorn here in Alberta. So this is sort of a map of, that I got from the Alberta Utilities Commission, but I brought it up because it highlights our key linkage area around Medicine Hat. And what I did is I just sort of roughly drew on the map the migration paths that three individuals took. So the two here in black are animals that crossed to the east of Medicine Hat across Highway 1. And then the animal in red is an animal that was unique in terms of she sort of made a, a west movement, crossed Highway 3 first, and then went up and across Highway 1 uh, as all animals headed north. But you can see this is a changing landscape. Since we did our original study almost, well, 20 years ago now, the bypass route that goes sort of around Medicine Hat has changed significantly. We have see this, um, what is it, the UFA or co-op uh, farm implementation plant that has chain link fence around it, which is a complete barrier to pronghorn movement. And then even across the, the highway, the bypass route, there's now a farm mechanic place with a chain link fence. And interestingly enough, this animal here that crossed um, Highway 3 went through the bypass route and almost crossed exactly where this now chain link fence is. And then there's also been expansion of the ag um, industrial development along this bypass route, as well as um, acreages have popped up who have been planting trees that are now growing and creating visual barriers. So I'm not even sure if this animal here in red would still be able to complete this movement pathway along this bypass route. And then you look at Highway 3, um, sorry. Right, now there's proposed changes to Twin Highway 3 from Medicine Hat all the way through to Tabor. So we're gonna go from four lanes, uh, sorry, two lanes of traffic to four lanes of, of traffic. And as far as I know right now, there hasn't been any consideration for pronghorn migration or movement or connectivity across this in their plans for, for upgrading this highway. And then we have the wind energy and turbines being set up. Um, I think there's something like 20 turbines in this area and I counted 46 in this area. And as you can see, they're right in the pathway of, of pronghorn movement and migration. And some of the studies out of Wyoming um, that have started looking at the impacts of wind turbines on pronghorn is they find that animals tend to speed up 
when they hit these areas of development. So they increase their speed, which is an energetic cost when you're thinking about spring migration or fall migration. And then we also have solar farms, and this is the one proposed um, sort of here, which is um, almost 20 square kilometers in size with chain link fence all around it. And then basically chain link fence means that habitat is lost now to pronghorn. But one of the one study that's, and it's the only actually study that so far has looked at the influence or impact of solar energy on pronghorn also found that not only is there a direct habitat loss, but then there's also this indirect loss because they found that pronghorn avoided the area up to 40% the size of the area. So there's that additional now loss of, of habitat. So one of the things we've been thinking about is, is connectivity migration still able to go on in, in, in Alberta or not? And one of the things we might want to look at is now is we're, we're discussing um, doing a second collaring study. We're putting um, additional collars out on pronghorn and just looking at how potentially migration and connectivity has changed for pronghorn in, in Alberta, given this changing environment, particularly in the key linkage area. Um, one of the other things we're sort of working on with pronghorn crossing and the, the Mistakis Institute is, can we actually put a overpass along Highway 1 in Alberta as well as Saskatchewan to maintain this connectivity? And why we're considering an overpass is because pronghorn's main line of defense is their eyesight. They can see movement almost a mile away. So studies in Wyoming have shown like 90% of pronghorn are gonna use an overpass and very few will use an underpass. So we're gonna be restricted um, to doing an underpass. So we've been working with the Mustakis Institute on the prong project called Pronghorn Crossing to sort of identify potential sites along Highway 1 where we could put an overpass and then now we're sort of moving into the next phases. Okay, how would we make this a reality? But sort of moving forward in terms of what may happen for pronghorn, and during our original study, uh, we had 170 animals and 45% of those were resident and 55% were migratory. And then kind of we have to ask ourselves, what happens is if we flip that scale, we change the balance of the scale and we have 100% residents and no migratory animals because of the changed landscape, what would that actually mean for future pronghorn populations in Alberta? In particularly, would we be, especially for animals north of Highway 1, sort of a major winter way of having a mass die-off and then a very, very slow um, population recovery because those animals become trapped north of Highway 1 in inhospitable conditions and we see die-offs. And we kind of see that a little bit now. Um, I think the last die-off, 2010, 2011, um, there's like a number of animals that moved into the city of Medicine Hat and at least a third of them died. Um, and it, it really impacts Alberta's population. Or what happens if global warming is right and we start to see more drought and change in habitat conditions in Alberta? Um, what would that mean for pronghorn if they're not able to move and migrate to find more suitable habitat during those drought conditions? And I think this is some of the things that are playing, off, playing out in Texas where um, animals have been experiencing drought for a number of years and because of the fencing down there, they're unable to move or migrate that slowly over time productivity of pronghorn goes down and we see these big declines in, in pronghorn populations. So I just kind of want to leave that with you in terms of, of think about, you know, ch Alberta's changing grasslands, um, as Livio mentioned, even declining uh, native prairie um, over the years, what that may mean for pronghorn. And with that, I will take questions. Great, thank you very much. This is, uh, that was a lot of information, Paul. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I kind of went a little bit long, but I love pronghorns, so I don't mind talking about them. Yeah, no, I, I can understand that, They're, that's cool. Um, so do we have any, questions in the chat there, Catherine? Uh, nope, we don't right now. Okay. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool with the, with the migration and the, and the, the difference in your, uh, oh, 
your migratory herds and your uh, animals and your uh, and your stationary. Um, mm -hmm. Cause we've got we've got a few here but yeah there's, there's one one fawn a year it seems like in the in the in the whole herd that wanders around our area here so um but yeah that's it's interesting and i and i had never seen a white tail cross under a fence until we put up smooth wire hmm. yeah <laughs> and at that 18 inches right yeah the mule deer and white tail seem to prefer as long with pronghorn that 18 inches and as long as they're not disturbed and spooked deer will go under the fence as opposed to jump over yeah yeah it seems like as long as they don't have a uh a set of antlers that that'll hang them up on the on the wire they they'll go they'll hit it and and keep traveling so it's it's pretty neat yeah yeah okay we have a couple of questions now for you paul um from sarah uh wondering if she missed it but does the hair grow back you know what i'm not sure um because it is so brittle and we don't have photos of the same individuals over time um but it's kind of yeah it's an interesting question i think it might unless it gets frostbitten and then that skin becomes damaged and and scarred and then i don't think it would Thank you. And then another question for you is, can you speak a bit more to the impact of renewables on pronghorn? Do they impact resident populations the same way as migratory animals? It's a really good question. And it's one of the things we're hoping to look at with our new study. And that's because there's been like three studies in Wyoming on, on wind energy and one study on solar on the impacts of prong corn and that's it across the range. So we're kind of at the infancy of trying to figure out what renewable energy means for this species. Okay. And another question, how optimistic are you that an overpass or more than one will become a reality? <laughs> um, yes, I'm op optimistic, um, but when we, we did a field trip in, I think it was September or October where we looked at the potential sites with, you know, Alberta Transportation, Alberta Fish and Wildlife. And sort of on the drive back to Lethbridge, uh, myself and my colleague who's much younger than I am, we were joking about whether it would actually happen before I retired or before she retired. And I think we both concluded that likely before she retires and not before I retire. <laughs> um, I mean, these are these are expensive endeavors. I think it's something like 17 or 18 million just for an overpass. And then likely we would have to put in, you know, um, deflector fences to sort of funnel animals to that. But we're also looking at making it a system. So we would also connect it to an underpass potentially just outside of Medicine Hat where there's mule deer uh, animal vehicle collision issues. So we'd kind of like make a system and, and do both species at once. Great. Um, another question for you, are these migratory maps publicly available? It would be really helpful for project planning to have them. Um, I, they're technically not publicly available, like there's no site where you can go to and just download it, but we've been pretty much open to sharing the data with people. So, you know, we've provided it to Fish and Wildlife for their planning events. We've provided it to Saskatchewan for their management of the species. Um, yeah, so if, if people are interested in it, um, certainly contact myself and we can figure something out. Okay. Can I add in, Catherine? Sorry, hmm? Paul, we, we've just, uh, the PCF has just acquired um, Andrew Jake's uh, migratory uh, the pronghorn work and that's been uploaded onto the PCF mapping tool that was an MOU that we signed so there is some information available there and if anybody's interested go to the website look under work currently being done um, and it's connecting quarters and then there's a link to a mapping tool there and that's one of the layers that is in there. Oh perfect yeah and I think that's his latest uh, connectivity maps because we've rerun the analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. How wide are the known crossings? Uh, so for prong corn under the fence, it'd be about maybe two feet wide. Okay. 
Yeah, they're not really wide. Like one of the, that's one of the unique things, and you kind of seen it in that video for pronghorn. When they cross the fence as a group, most of the time they do it single file. Like they all pile up at the fence and then go through one at a time. Hmm. We got very few images of pronghorn crossing as a group where multiple individuals are crossing at the same time. Right. So for some reason, they just watch each individual go. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and have you observed antelope expanding into new areas within Alberta? Yes, it's kind of one of the unique things is the last few years, there's been some pronghorn that somehow have made their way across highway two, um, north of sort of between Airdrie and Calgary, and they've got on the west side and they've been hanging out there. And then one of them last winter when we had all of those major snow events showed up in the city of Calgary by herself. And I kind of I kind of think that she got either separated from the group that's sort of between Calgary and Airdrie or the other members perished during the winter conditions and she was by herself and sort of moved south looking for more favorable conditions. So we hear those stories. I've heard stories of them being a herd around the Edmonton International Airport. That's been for a few years now. And then even as far north as Fort Saskatchewan. And then every once in a while, I have pictures from a colleague of them showing up actually in Waterton National Park. And I suspect this was a, there's a sort of a group, small group that hangs out south of Cardston and during a major winter storm, it kind of pushed them north and then they ended up in the park. Hmm. Interesting. And maybe just one last question here before we have to move on. And um, it was, if you have any recommended reading on pronghorns, academic or books or anything? Um, depends what you're looking for. If you want a really overview um, of the pronghorn itself, the book chapter that we just published, um, it's kind of, the book is actually geared almost towards students and to be used as a textbook in classes. And I'll see if I can, find the exact name of it, sort of like rangeland, wildlife, ecology, and management. Let me just here, I'll just double check, make sure that's the right one. And that's actually available online free as a PDF. Well, while you're looking for that, Paul, um, I did have a couple of questions from, from Tracy. She just asked if uh, the data from 2010, 2011 winter, uh, specifically the massive winter migration to the south, did they come back to Canada or do you know? Uh, so unfortunately we don't know there um, because we only had callers on pronghorn in Alberta from 2003 to 2007. And then based on our work and seeing that they're interconnected between Montana and Saskatchewan, Alberta, then they had callers on animals in Saskatchewan and Montana during that major winter. And then unfortunately, 20, the winter of 2010, 2011 was the last year of the study. So as we were transitioning into spring of 2011, after the major winter, that's when the collars fell off and we don't have whether those animals moved north. Um, we do know that some of the animals that went south into Montana and got on the south side, I think it's Fort Peck Reservoir, um, they did try to come back north. Um, but as the reservoir opened up, they are basically trying to swim across the reservoir and there's images um, of animals drowning in the reservoir um, and then just getting washed up on shore because they were just so exhausted and couldn't swim all the way across. Okay. And, and also are, are you or somebody working with the railroads to have uh, non, non fence spots for them to cross? Uh, no one's working with the railroads. Right now, we're hoping to eventually be able to work with the railroad roads, but they they don't seem to be re that receptive right now um, to engaging us. But it's one of the things we want to look at. Like, where one of our proposed mitigation sites is, we call it Site Five, um, where we want to put one of the overpasses. Is we're looking at putting an overpass over the road, but then there'd also have to be another one um, sort of over the railway tracks as well, because the last thing we want to do is move animals over the highway and then get them stuck on the railway tracks. Yeah, oh, that's right. Okay, perfect. And then here, I'll get that uh, publication. And also, right. if you guys look in the questions box, Amanda has dropped the link to that 
book chapter. Oh, okay. 